Hi, uh, I'm Peter Levine, the developer of Somatic Experiencing. The word somatic is the body, not just the anatomical body, but the living sensing body, the sensing knowing body, and experience, the experience of the living body. It's an approach I developed over the past 45 years. I first taught it to a group of Berkeley therapists, about 15 Berkeley therapists in my called it my treehouse uh, in Wildcat Canyon, just outside of Berkeley. And in my mind, that's where somatic experiencing is. Now I'm, <laughs> I'm somewhat overwhelmed to learn that somatic experiencing now has been taught to over 50,000 people in 43 different countries. So I figure, well, there must be something to it. And when where people are traumatized, it's not just something that happens in the mind that happens in the brain, it's something that happens in the body. Our guts twist. Uh, they, they're in distress. They're, they're uh, di 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 dyspneptic. <laughs> people develop symptoms like irritable bowel and, and, and so forth. And so really the the root of somatic experiencing is to help people have experiences in their bodies that you could say uh, 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 are opposite to the experience of the trauma as it's registered in the body. Because um, to have a new experience in the body a new experience that contradicts the feelings of fear and shutdown and overwhelm. And in many ways, it's a very simple process. Uh, as I say, it's been taught now in 44 different countries. So it's in many ways culturally friendly because it, again, it works with the language of the body, not the language of the person. I mean, of course, you have to have you know some either knowledge of the person's, uh, of, of people's language, or a translator. But mostly, it's something that comes from the internal ex experience of the body, of the, of the living body. And, uh, and that's really it, that's really it. And I spent my, much of my life also, not only teaching it, I'm mostly retired from teaching, but I do do postgraduate classes, post-advanced level classes in, in different countries. And um, I'm, I've written a number of books, uh, starting with my one that became a bestseller, Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma. Then after that, I wrote a book called In an Unspoken Voice, How the Body Releases Trauma and Restores Goodness. I also most recently wrote a book uh, called Trauma and Memory because people even, even therapists, lay people, and, and even experienced therapists really don't understand uh, memory, trauma memory, which is completely different than normal memory called declarative memory. So how to access those systems in helping people heal and to resolve these procedural um, so-called body memories that have arisen from early trauma that we've experienced even be, you know, pre-verbally before there were words, probably all the way back to, um, to our in, ut in uterine experiences in our, in our mother's wombs. What that was like, was it safe, was it nurturing? Uh, what did we get the feeling of really being wanted and, and so forth? And over time, uh, Somatic experience was originally designed primarily for uh, for individual shock trauma, so for after people had accidents or invasive medical procedures and so forth. But it's now adapted more broadly to the needs that are more salient today of people who have a lot of early trauma, so-called developmental or chronic stress. And actually my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation was titled accumulated stress, reserve capacity, and dis-ease. Not disease, but dis-ease. And if you say accumulated stress, 
reserve capacity, which is really about resilience, about the capacity of the nervous system, the body, to rebound from these threatening and, and potentially overwhelming events. So, I also wrote a couple of books with Maggie Klein on working with children uh, that have trauma, trauma through a child's eyes, and a book for parents and educators called uh, Trauma Proofing Your Kids. Also did a book with Maggie Phillips, a different Maggie, both dear friends, and uh, that was on chronic pain, resolving chronic pain, and now I'm working on it project, a really big project, which sounds true, to do an online program to help people who have these chronic health conditions that don't seem to ha have a cause, such as uh, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, um, certain migraines, uh, chronic fatigue, and so forth. So, I, I, you know, I, what can I say? I've been blessed to be able to help, I guess, millions of people. So anyhow, that's me in a nutshell, and I hope to meet you in one of the classes that I'll be doing with the clear mind focus in mind. Okay. As an example of understanding the dynamics of uh, neuroception, this is a term coined by my very dear friend and colleague um, Stephen Porges, to say how the nervous system sorts out what's safe, what's threatening, and what's life-threatening. And the vagus nerve is involved particularly in life threat. What many people, many even many physicians, and even some physiologists aren't aware that the vagus nerve, though it's an unmyelinated nerve, this part of the nerve is unmyelinated, goes from the back of the brain, then down through here, down into the body cavities, and connects to the gastrointestinal system, the heart and the lungs, and really to all of the other organs as well. And as I was saying, what people generally are not aware is that nerve, it's the largest nerve in the body by far. It's the grand information highway because it's not only sending signals from the brain stem down to, the, to our guts, to our organs, but it's receiving information from our guts and our organs and relaying it back up to the brain. And the sensory part of the vagus nerve, which I'm just describing, uh, is 80% sensory, 80% afferent. So, for example, you step outside and you see somebody has been hit by a car and your guts go, ugh. And then you see he's really, really badly hurt. And you go, oh, and that can stay with us. Or we can bring up images of that, which then stay with us. And um, so what we have to do, well, so what happens again, we get that yuck, but because the vagus nerve is sensory, it sends 80% of it, that information gets sent back up into the brainstem where it's amplified. So we go, ugh, ugh, ugh. And then we're developing symptoms like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And the key here, and in doing a lot of the exercises that I've designed in somatic experiencing, is to be able to get information changing from the gut back up to the brain. So one exercise that I use, and again, it's not just doing the exercise, you have to notice what happens with the person. But the idea is to take an easy full breath and on the exhalation make the sound vu coming from the belly and let the breath and the sound go all the way out. So, vu, and I'm vibrating in here, vu, and I let the air and the, the breath and the sound all the way out. Wait for the breath to come in on its own. Well, it's doing a lot of different things. It's, it's, it's changing the respiratory rhythm, but primarily what it's doing is sending a new signal from the guts that says everything is okay. You don't have to carry that image with you for the rest of your life, or that trauma with you for the rest of your life.
I start out with, you know, just, of course, watching it for a little while. Then I do the voo. So, Peter, do you start out breathing in? Do you start breathing no, in? No, no. You, you take an easy breath in. Easy breath, okay. That's the key. You know, because you don't want to get into this high breathing because that's exactly the opposite of what you want. What do you, what do you call an easy breath? How do you do an easy breath? Here. Okay, it's a full breath, but it's an easy breath. It starts more from the belly and then gently goes up to the chest. And then as you exhale, with the vu, you let the sound and the breath go all the way out. And the breath goes all the way out. And then just allow the breath to come in again, this time filling belly, then chest, and then repeat. So do that two or three times. I'll often bring in the jaw, because that's really about our power, our, our healthy aggression, our ability to, you know, bite into life. And so I'll do that for a couple of, a couple of breaths. And then, then just rest, and then just settle with the... Uh, with the with the uh, the sequence, the four second sequence, because then that really lets you drop into your body. I would probably want to do the SMR, you know. At the end. At the end, yeah. Okay. Really, or or the sensory motor, you know, both, either one. Right to left, or just yeah, yeah. Uh, or and then just, just go program. back to right to left. Just experience that. Because after you've done the breath and the healthy aggression, then your, your organism is really ready to settle. So then just, just let it go and just observe sensations, feelings, thoughts, images as the, as the, as the, uh, the eyeglasses just take you from right to left. To right, to left. Got it? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So you're, you're taking a, a gentle breath in and you're letting it... Start with an easy, gentle breath. Bring in the jaw then. And then rest, and then just pendulate, just shift back and forth between the, the between the two sides. So on the in breath, you're just taking an in breath, and the out breath, you're making the vu. The vu, okay. right? And you're letting the breath and the sound go all the way out, and that's waiting for the next breath to come in. Trick is on its own. Mm -hmm. But you don't breathe it in. You don't take a breath, but you just allow the breath to come in filling belly and chest. That's the key. That's, that's why it's so different than counting breaths. Because, you, first of all, you're, you, you're letting the breath reset itself, and you're also connecting it, the, the visceral sensations, the visceral feelings from the jaw. So these are really our basic needs, our basic sense of ourselves come from our, you know, from our, our guts, our belly and then connecting that to the, to the jaw. And then doing that a couple of times, and then just let things go, and then just follow the glasses, you know, right, left, right, left. So when you have the glasses on, are your eyes open or closed? Open, well, I mean, you can do either one. But I start open, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in general, you know, what I suggest to people, 
is that they can open and close their eyes whenever they want, whatever feels mm -hmm. right for them. Right, because you're going to get fatigued after probably 10 minutes, right? They'll get a little tired, maybe, and they can close their yeah, eyes. Yeah, exactly. That's a time when you really kind of drift, you know, it, it kind of a cholinergic, you know, state in the brain. Then you can close out your eyes and still see the lights with your yeah, eyes closed. Yeah, the lights are still there. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's actually more settling. It's actually deeper when your eyes are closed because you're still getting the light but it's not it's the light is more subtle <laughs> yeah and you're so processing with your and eyes closed yeah you're, you're really enhancing the processing how are you enhancing it just by following the right left swing so what happens what how does that change your state when you go from processing eyes open to eyes closed uh, I mean, it depends, you know, it's different for different people. But I think generally, with your eyes closed, you naturally tend to go more inside. And so that's where you would want to come at the end of that sequence, the boo, the jaw, and then just let things settle inside. And I think that's probably when people are going to want to, you, you can suggest they can, but they're going to want to close their eyes and still see the flashing, but it's not as intense, it's softer. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're wanting to take the people into a softer uh, process. Do you start out with the VU or do you wait a while? Uh, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter, I might wait a while. And then, and then mm -hmm. just give the, the instruction without taking, without just taking a deep, a soft, deep breath maybe even beginning in your belly, but it's a soft, deep breath. And vibrate it down in the belly. Remember, that's the afferent sensory part of the vagus nerve. Let the sound of the breath go all the way out, but then let the breath come in on its own. That's the key, because that's the resetting. And let the breath come in, and again, and then bring in the jaw if you want. And then again, just closing the eyes and seeing the flickering kind of from the inside. It's, that's maybe a better way of describing it. When your eyes are open, the light's clearly coming from the outside. Mm. When, uh, when your eyes are closed, the light is more coming from the inside. That's not exactly what I'm trying to say, but it's something like that. Even yeah. more internal. It's right? more internal. It's more internal. Yeah. 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 So how long would you leave those on? How long would you do that exercise? Oh, good point. Um, um, well, how long is it set for? Thirty minutes. Oh no, I would do it maybe fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Fifteen. So how does this differ than doing it with the eyes open? Well, with the eyes closed, again, it's a soft... Oh, I mean the eyes open glasses. Oh. Well, you know, that one for sure you want to use with people who are, you know, heavily traumatized and you want to keep in contact with them. You know, we were talking before about, um, uh, about, um, uh, oh gosh, about, you know, um, attachment issues, at least there's somebody there. Because if you're just here, you can get lost. But if you're looking through the eyes open, that other person is still there. And that can make a big difference, having somebody there while you're processing. Because the problem was, as children, we didn't have somebody that was there. The way I put it is it's not just what happened to us, the trauma. It's not just the trauma that happened to us but it's really what we hold inside in the absence of a present empathic witness with the eyes open is that you're in contact with the, that other, you know, that present person who's there with you, who's accompanying you on that inner journey. And really the power of this is to help bridge the person to that inner 
journey, but still in contact with that present empathetic other. And so that's why I would always, with traumatized people, I would always start with eyes open, with the peripheral lights. Because you get, you get a similar effect, but it's not nearly as powerful, not nearly as strong. And again, you're able to start to drift. You can do the vu and the jaw, all of those things. You can do that with the eyes opening, because as you do it, you're, uh, this other is reflecting it t to you, is, is, is guiding you, is taking your hand to this inner journey. And that's why I would almost always start with the, uh, with the eyes open. When do you know when to stop and switch to M SMR? How do you time it? How do you know your patient's done or it's time to integrate and switch to SMR? Well, um, I mean, I think after you do the, you know, the VU and the, the going back and forth, I think after, you know, just five, ten minutes I would go to the SMR. To, to deepen the integration. I mean, you're already doing the integration by just, you know, being in, in trained with the lights going back and forth. What do you notice when a person seems to be complete? What, what are you looking for? You see them settled. You see easy, full, spontaneous breaths. You see really nice color in their face, a warmth in their face. Uh, often when you start with a person, you'll notice that their fingers, their fingernails are almost blue or gray, that they're at the end, they're a rosy color. So you want to really look for those autonomic shifts because that's telling you that there has been a shift in the, in the autonomic nervous system. So when you see that shift in the autonomic nervous system, that's telling you that it's time to integrate, that you're... you're yeah, and say that's it, that's great. And then I would then say, let's watch this other frequency, see how that, what that's like for you, and then you can go to the SMR. Okay, and then how long would you run the SMR? It depends. I, would, I might do it five or ten minutes at first. You know, it's always best, I think, to do it less initially. The whole treatment less? No, the, the timing, to be on it less time. Yeah. For both, for both the Schumann and the Alpha and the SMR? Oh, I, you know, I think you, I would just do one at a time. I would just do the SMR or the Schumann or the Alpha. I would do a different one on a different session. I wouldn't do them ever at the same session probably. Right, but you end with SMR. You always end with you SMR. Do, yeah, it's always good to, yes, that's and where you always, end most, with SMR. most always want to end on okay. the SMR. Okay, and when you're going back and forth here, you're you're following just the same way. So you'd be doing vu. Would you be doing it any differently with your eyes open? No. Okay. No. No. Can you just go into a little more detail about how you move your jaw and why you move your jaw and well, with the primal well, part of that? Yeah. Well, it is primal. It's animalistic. It's the part of our. body self that's, that makes us, allows us to stand up for ourselves, to get what we want and need in life, to bite into life. I mean, think of it, you have this incredible, juicy, organic apple, and as you bring it towards your face, you start to smell it, you start to salivate it, your jaw gets ready, and then... <sighs> So that's the type of movement, but it's like wow, biting into life. I call this healthy aggression, to be able to connect with our guts and move that, move us into the world, out into the world. And are you integrating bottom up and top down approach by doing it that way? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's primarily bottom-up, but there, yeah, there's some... But you're adding lights, which is top-down, right? The lights? Mm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the lights are also affecting that... I mean, the bottom-up, for sure, is the, the, the vu, the breathing, and the jaw. 
that's definitely bottom-up. But these also enhance the bottom-up processing, I think. In what way? It allows you to deepen with them. Deepen because it changes your brainwave state? Your brainwave? I, I assume that it would in, in some way, I don't know exactly how, but yeah. So once you do the VU and you're feeling in your body the, what are you looking for? What type of feeling in your body are you looking for? Settling. Settling, okay. Remember, easy, spontaneous breaths, good color. With, if, you, if, you're, if, you're good in, if you can see the carotid pulse, just to notice if on the in-breath there's a slight increase in the carotid rate, the, heart, the heartbeat. And on the exhalation, spontaneous exhalation, you notice a slight slowing of the heart rate as evidence from the, uh, from the carotid pulse, the carotid artery. And then what about color and... Well, the color of the face, and it's rosy. The color of the fingernails, also rosy. You know, uh, when the person is in a, in a sympathetic state, or even sympathetic and shut down state, uh, you know, the, there's vasoconstriction, there's constriction of the blood to the fingers. And you'll, again, you'll see that the fingernails tend to be blue. And then you're looking at, oh, they, they shifted to a nice, easy, rosy color. And you also will notice the color change in the face. That also can vary with the, with the breath. So on the in-breath, you'll notice a uh, color change, a different color change on the out-breath. Oh. Yeah. What color changes are you looking for? Well, you'll see a, 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 like a wave of color moving up from the chest to the throat into the face. Usually that's on the exhalation. So when that happens, what, what's going on with that person? The autonomic nervous system is, is balancing. So that's how you time your sessions? Right. I don't time it just with, with counting the minutes, but, but noticing the shifts. That's the, that's the big difference. So we don't, then we don't do it kind of in a, a mechanistic way but really observe what's going on and, and, you know, and I often will say, so that's it. Yeah, just noticing that. Unfortunately, when people see me doing that, a lot of times they'll just say, that's it, when nothing has happened. And if you do that, you know the person just tunes you out because they know that you're bullshitting. Right. Excuse my French. Well, there must be a big connection between the person having an experience and the other, the therapist validating it, right? Right. Again, you know, that the, the child, the, the, their child so often was not mirrored. They weren't like, wow, oh, wow, that's so nice. You have such a nice smile. Oh, wow, that's really a great breath. So it's that kind of interplay between the, the, the adult and the child, that, that in a sense is simulated by this. Yeah. We get to revisit it, to, re, to renegotiate it, to rework it. 